Now, the 70s definitely had a very unique sound. Bands like Fleetwood Mac, Total, Bee Gees, and Eagles, and many more, definitely had a distinct sound during the 70s era. In this video, I want to share with you five ways to get that 70s sound and feel to your productions. Let's dive right in. So I've got a session here open in Ableton Live of a song that I'm working on, and the artist that I'm producing really wanted to dial in in that Fleetwood Mac 70s type of vibe. So I made two versions, one without the tips that I'm going to be sharing with you in this video, and one with the tips, so that you can A, B, and hear the difference just a few simple tweaks can make for your tracks. So let's go ahead and take a listen. I'll start with the one without any tips applied. So 70 eras music production tip number one is keep it live and loose. A big part of that era is just the actual process of recording those songs. Musicians came to the recording studio, they learned their parts, performed it well, and it was recorded the way they performed it. There wasn't any MIDI sequencing, there was no piano rolls at that time, so you couldn't just draw in and program the parts. You had to actually learn it, perform it, and record it. And now, when we fast forward to the ability to just be able to draw in your notes, draw in your patterns, drag and drop loops, it's important that you keep that understanding of that live and loose feel so that your drums or parts aren't feeling so robotic. Let me show you what I mean. So here's the drum groove. Now, I want to be sure that when I'm programming these drums, whether I'm playing them by hand or drawing them in, that I'm adjusting the velocity so that there's some change in the actual volume so that we're not getting a stiff, same volume all the way through for each individual instrument, snare, kick, and the hi-hat. So I'll make sure to accent certain hi-hats, in this case by holding the command key, hovering over it and going up or down, and the brighter the color, the stronger the velocity and the louder and more accented that note will be. And what I'll do is randomly go through each individual hi-hat note, lower it or raise it up. That way there's a difference in covering some nuances with the overall hi-hat performance. And I'll do the same thing with the snare drum so that each individual hit would change in velocity and accent. So, and I'll do this with all the instruments. And now it can be a little tedious, but it actually goes a long way in creating that live looseness in the program parts. Another helpful tool is extracting grooves. Groove extraction is where you can take the groove, the timing, velocity of an audio or a MIDI, extract that groove and apply it to another source. So for instance, here I have a drum loop. And if we look closely in that drum loop, we notice that certain the hits are, aren't really on the grid. We've got some looseness there. We've got some timing, velocity. And so I'd like to extract that. So I'll right click on here and I'll choose Extract Grooves. And once I've done that, it'll open up your groove pool and you'll see the name of that groove that you've extracted. Now you can determine how much of the timing that you want to match when you apply this groove to another source. How much of the velocity would you like it to match? So in this case, let's leave the velocity down at zero and leave the timing at 100. I'll take that groove and now apply it to my MIDI performance here. So let's take a look now and head over to the Groove dialog box, open that up, this drop down menu, and choose the Fleetwood drums and hit the arrow to apply it. And you see some minor changes happen. Now we've got some hi-hats here that are now a little bit ahead. And we also see the kick move. So it's applied the timing. We can see that hi-hat a little ahead here. So now let's listen in to just our new drum groove. And so it's got that feel in there, it's still in the pocket, but that looseness goes a long way. Tip number two is keeping it dry and dirty. A big part of that 70s era sound 
was that a lot of the recording studios really focused in on that dead acoustic treatment that captured that in-your-face dry type of sound. Specifically with drums and a lot of instrumentation, they weren't really washed out and drowned out with effects and reverb. They were really close mic and in-your-face, and that was because of that dry, dead type of sound. So let's focus in on that. So I'm using Excellent Audio's Addictive Drums 2, and I'm going with the Vintage Dry. And it really is a big part of sound selection. If you can get the sound zeroed in from the get-go, that's a lot less work you have to do in the long run. So I like the kit there. It's aiming for the same type of vibe that I'm going for. But I'm doing some things here in the kit so I can customize the sound a little more. First thing you'll notice is that I'm assigning all the kick, snare, hi-hat, and sounds that I want to a separate output. So I'll click the arrow on the bottom and choose separate out so it goes post fader. And that allows me to bypass the faders here and actually create an audio track in Ableton Live set to the input monitoring so I can have a little bit more control in crafting the sound that I'm looking for. So now the kick, snare, hi-hat, overhead, and room mics are now going to show up through these audio tracks here in Ableton Live. Now I'm also doing some tweaking here within the actual plugin itself. To get more of a snappy response with the snare drum, I'm making sure to enable the volume envelope. If by default, the volume envelope is kind of set around here, and you hear a lot of the tail end of that snare. So I'm bringing that back down so it makes it nice and tight. would be the equivalent of just deading up that snare drum by putting towels or a bunch of things to just deaden up the sound. I'm going to accomplish that by using the volume envelope. Also, focusing on the mic placement and which mic to focus in on. You can choose the top or the bottom. The bottom is going to give you a lot of that snare rattle, so I'd focus on the top of the snare. Tip number three is that all roads lead to tape. Back then, in that time, everything was being recorded onto tape machines, and so the playback would also be from the tape machine as well. A great way to do this is using some tape emulation plugins, whichever one you like. I'd also like to showcase you a really good one that's free that you can put after the source of your sound. So for instance, I have some addictive keys here, playing some roads. So right after that, I would record it onto the tape. So here I have Chow, tape model, which is a free plugin, to great tape emulation. There are so many options here that you can use to really tweak and get the sound that you're looking for. But what we're going after is just that nice warmth and a bit of saturation here with the tape. So you can warm this up. You can really tweak this child tape model and get the right type of texture you're looking for. But I'm going to be using tape on pretty much all the tracks, any instruments, whether I'm recording them or performing them, and including the vocal as well. So I put the tape at first so that the vocal is recorded onto the tape, and then the playback comes from the tape machine It's as well. So that's going to be the first part of this, and I will put this on all the tracks. could even put a tape machine on the master bus as well, so that I'm tracking everything down to a specific inch tape. This is what's really going to create that nice warmth and saturation that we can get that we hear from a lot of the records during that time. Another tip here is using tape delay. Tape delay was widely used throughout the 70s era, and you could hear it on the vocals and a lot of the instrumentation. So for the lead vocal here, I decided to go with a tape delay, which is routed to my return track D. Wait till I get away to some fairy tale and changing my latitude. And we're looking for a short slap delay. And I'm using the Galaxy Tape Echo. Uh, you could use any tape echo that you might have, or even stock delays as well. I'll use the Ableton Live delay here. Wait till I get away to some fairy tale land. The point is just creating a nice short feedback and setting the time, or you can sync it to your project 
we're kind of going for that short uh, slap back delay effect here. And then what I'll do is blend the output of that return track down so I get a nice place with the vocal. And slap back delays and short delays were also used as a cool gimmicky type trick on various different instruments, such as drums. So if we had the drums here and I use that same type of delay, it really creates this nice cool effect. And plate reverbs was pretty much a lot of the reverbs being used during that time as well. So just like the delay, I'll run the vocal through some plate as well. So here I have a plate reverb. I'm using the UAD Audio uh, EMT 140 plate. Now remember, it's balancing that with that dead dry sound as well. So I'm not trying to overdo it and drench the vocals in reverb but I do want to create a little bit of space and dimension so that it just feels like it's in the right space with the rest of the track. And another way to kind of warm up the sound is by using your stock EQ to shave away some of the high end just of your overall mix or certain elements in the track. Heading over to this acoustic guitar track that I have playing using the strummed acoustic from Native Instruments. I'll actually use the child tape model, turning it on to actually use the high cut to illuminate some of that brightness. Eliminating some of the high end with just even a stock EQ or tape plugin such as this can help create some of that warmth and get that aesthetic that you're looking for that we can hear on a lot of the 70s records. I wanted to focus in on using synths that were actually available during the recording of Fleetwood Mac's record around 1976 or so. So one of the synths that were there is the ARP. So I decided to just pull up the ARP 2600. I know it's not the exact same one, but I wanted to use this and just kind of capture that same type of vibe in this record as well with some pads and some kind of mysterious uh, drones in the background. As you can see, I'm also running it through the child tape model to capture the tape emulation. And let's see what that does here. We'll take it at the chorus. Now in closing, I realized that a big part of that 70s sound was just the era that musicians, artists, and amazing talent were just put in a room recording some magic. And that is 95% of what's being captured and what we're enjoying from that era. And I'm not saying that what I just sh shared with you in this video is going to magically transform your projects into what was captured in that era. But those are some distinct things that you can implement in your productions that can help you kind of get and steer in that ballpark that at least create that sonic fingerprint that you can admire from records in that 70s era. So I hope this was encouraging and inspiring and you were able to pick up a tip or two that you can add into your productions. And if you're looking for professional guidance to help you level up your skill set with your music production, then I want to encourage you to visit beatacademy.com to see how we can help you take that next step forward with your music production goals. I just wanna say thank you for taking the time to watch this video, and as my gift to you for watching, I'd love to send you a free VST plugin, as well as a sound pack filled with loops, construction kits, sounds, and a bunch of Ableton Live templates and effects. It really is an amazing basket of goodies that I've prepared for you, and it's yours absolutely free. Just click the link below in the description box or visit beatacademy.com slash pack to access this bundle of goodness. Now, thank you so much for watching. Be sure to subscribe, share this video with plenty of your friends who are in music production, and uh, I'll see you next time.